Bible TV. My name is Nekme Obasoge, broadcasting live from Toronto, Canada. We are here today to discuss a very unique topic, a topic that people don't normally discuss about on social media. I have five professionals with me in the studio today. Uh, these professionals are specialized in children's services in the West. So uh, before we go directly to the program, I'm going to introduce the professionals. First uh, on the list is uh, Mrs. Esosa Edogia Warrior a speech and language pathologist from the United Kingdom. You are welcome to the program today. Hello. Thank you for having me. Lovely to be here. Thanks for joining the program today. So the next person on the list is uh, Riholi Bitata. She is joining us all the way from Spain. And she's a high school teacher in the United Kingdom. Thanks for joining the program today. Your pleasure. Thank you for having me. Mrs. Katie Salami, all the way from California, United States. She's a social worker in California. Thanks for joining the program today, Ma. Thank you for having me. The nice person is Ms. Bimbo Thomas. She's a social worker here in Toronto, Canada. Thanks for joining the program today, Bimbo. Thanks, Nekbe, and thanks for having me here. Let's just proceed with this program. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nekbe. It's my pleasure speaking to the audience tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us from Nigeria. Thank you. So uh, yeah, before we we'll start the program today, because today's program uh, focuses on the cultural relativism of raising children. In other words, the cultural differences between raising children in the Western society and Africa using Nigeria as a country of focus. We are going to address it from a kind of African indigenous context. And uh, we have a general discussion before the main questions we commence. African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. The question is, do we still believe that this proverb is still applicable to uh, our African societies given this trend of globalization that many African societies mm -hmm. are gradually you know, transiting from a communal kind of family structure to more individualistic or kind of adopting the Western ways of life. First of all, I will bring uh, uh, Mrs. Sosa Edogia Warrior. So yeah, what do you think about this proverb, this popular African proverb? It mm. takes a village to raise a child. Do you think it's still applicable to our modern African society? Um, that's a very good question. Thank you for having me, Nekman. That's uh, it's a brilliant question. Um, I, I went to Nigeria recently, that was in March. I don't really think it is still practicable in, in some society today. However, it's still practicable in some society. Uh, it takes a village to raise a child. What, it depends what people think that means. From my perspective, it means that you just being the mother or the father of a child does not make you the only person responsible for that child. And um, I think in some African society, it become the sole responsibility of the parents to, to be res for that child. Nobody else care about the child's well-being. Whereas where in the Western culture, particularly in the UK where mm -hmm. I live, the, the welfare of the child is not only the parents' responsibility, it's everyone's responsibility. So if you are referring that, if that practicable in, in the Western yeah. culture, I think yes, it is practicable in Western culture. If you think, if I, if you ask whether it's practicable in Nigeria, I don't think it is practicable in Nigeria anymore. I don't think so. I don't think uh, people will be concerned if your next door neighbor's child is missing. Oh, do you mean, I, I, I just want to jump in. Do you mean that uh, it's reverse is the case these days? Yes, I absolutely agree oh, on that. Okay. Okay. Yes. I think the reverse is the case these days. 
that's an African proverb, like you said, but it's no longer practicable in some African culture, but it is a little bit more practicable in the Western culture where they probably have borrowed the proverb and apply it to their society these days. Huh. Interesting. I think it's a great idea to see uh, to see children's responsibility as a community thing, and not as a source said, not only uh, the job of a parent. For my personal um, experience, I never saw that African village. I was born and raised in Spain, and I never saw that African village. I saw. African people whenever we gathered for parties, but in a sense of those adults, those people knowing about my struggles individually as a child, those of my siblings, of myself, they never knew, they never asked, and there was nothing in place for us or anyone in the community to put forth those worries. That village in my opinion, has been replaced and has been replaced by the agencies uh, belonging to the government. So now, if you have an issue to do uh, with education, you cannot go to your auntie or uncle to a degree. If you're looking for, let's say, if you need uh, help with your finances, like university fees or scholarships, you need to go somewhere else is you need to go outside of that village to look for help. The idea of having a village is, I think is more applicable when we are in charge of the society that we are part. So meaning that we have created the structures for that village to operate. But as we are in an alien environment, that village has needs to change the way it operates. So we don't allow other agencies to monitor how we teach our children and how we function within that society. So yes, it does exist, but I think it's been, it's been compromised and it's been hijacked by the mere fact that we are living in the West. Hmm. Interesting. It's like the institutions that are serving uh, children in our society in the West is replacing that proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. What is the village in the West, for instance? We can say, okay, the community services, like the child welfare system, the teachers, you know, the speech pathologists that ensure that uh, these children meet their age milestone. So those are the institutions in place in the West that are serving this uh, big, that is, it, it, it takes a village to raise a child. Thank you, thank you. So let me bring uh, Miss Katie Salami here to tell us more about this proverb, this big African proverb that uh, it takes a village to raise a child. Do you think it's still applicable to our modern African societies? So go ahead. Um, I, I don't think it's really applicable in our uh, practices in Nigeria. The reason why it takes a village to raise in the community at the time, you know, people depend on each other. It takes a another to care for the interest of uh, a child. But these days, we've gone individualized. You know, it's no longer somebody's, you know, it's your problem if you. If your child is out there, nobody cares. That's what it is right now. In the days in my in my time when I was growing up, of course, you know, have a bigger auntie that's an adult. Hey, take care of this child. So there's always someone they just don't leave. There's always someone that is entrusted that my child is entrusted to them. But again, at the time of it takes a village to raise a child, they were respect responsibility they were the same values they were the same morals they were ideology were the same the beliefs were the same so it was safer at that time and it was convenient look at it takes a village to raise a child because at the time of the adults compared to the western world children here most of the adults it's not outdoor so when you have it like i grew up in a 
family. You know, we don't have enough room to feed everybody. So most of the time, half of us were like, hey. So when half of us are outside, so it really takes a village. Families and uncles have to look out for the best interest of me, of us as a child. You know, it just, it is what it was at that time. Yeah, Miss Bimbo, <laughs> go ahead. I know that, uh, you know, you have this experience in child services here in Canada and uh, you know, I know that you went to Nigeria and stayed there for a while, many years before you came back to Canada. You have been exposed to the system both here in Canada and in Nigeria. Tell us more about this proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. Do you think it's still practicable in our modern African societies? Yeah, Nepen, you are absolutely right. I did return to Nigeria and I stayed there for an ample period of time. And I was so amazed with the uh, cultural dilution when it comes to uh, that belief that it takes a, co um, a community to raise uh, a child. It, uh, it is gradually phasing out. In fact, it is doing so drastically, okay? And it's so, it makes my heart bleed. Because I remember uh, me growing up as a child, uh, I did not belong to my parents alone. We have uncles, aunties, extended relatives, right? And sometimes they send us away, you understand. And at the end of the day, when you become an adult, you have a myriad of experience, you know, growing up and you learn from, you know, each one of them. But today, it, is, it has changed. And unfortunately, it has changed for the wrong reasons not for the right reasons, okay? And I say this because, again, addressing the cultural dilution aspect of it, we want to act like the Western world. But even in the West, they still believe in this concept of, you know, uh, raising a uh, community, getting involved in raising children. But the Africans, we Africans, we are moving from that, you know, our traditional ways of raising children, and we want to act like the Westerners. And we don't even have uh, the resources. We don't even have the the know-how, you understand, to, to incorporate, you know, how they raise children uh, in, the, in, in, in the Western world. And I say that one of the reasons why I will even actually, I will even believe uh, we should be like moving away from the uh, normal way of raising children in the community. One of the reasons we should be moving away will be because of this abuse that is going on. So many children do send, that are sent away from home to relatives, we all know that they, they get abused. Although they don't speak out, now they are speaking out. But we are not looking into those reasons. We are looking into the flashiest aspect of it. You understand and that's why it really bleeds my heart that you know we are not that communal you know way of you know raising children the way we grow up we're moving away from it again for the very very wrong reasons thank you uh bimbo i understand what you are trying to say that uh, we are gradually transiting from that African uh, uh, proverb to more Western ways or family structure. However, do we have the institutions to support this, our transition? Probably yes, maybe yes, but are they really effective is the question. Next, I, can say, I can say something to that. I remember vividly, I. Actually, I uh, worked a parent to an office, a building. They have them. They have this institution in form of buildings, but they are not really very effective. They are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, but the buildings are there. So I, drag, I, I drove this parent to a building because I, I, I asked her to be in need of help, and I thought me just offering her money would, um, would not be enough. I really wanted her to be in the system just the way we do it here. You see, mm. here we have like child protection workers, you understand, which of course are regulated by the Child and Family Services Act of Otaro. Everything they do is in that act. So I wanted to like, I thought in fact that 
that's what they practice back home. So I drove this woman there to the office, expecting her, you know, to get the kind of services, the types that I render here, because I cannot do it on my own. You don't see people in the streets, you know, helping people in the Western world. There are organizations, there are institutions that do those things, right? So you just call, you make a referral. But in Nigeria, so I was trying to do the same thing, but I, I was really very disappointed. And I went outside and I kind of read the description of the building again. And I'm like, okay, this is supposed to be an office for this. What is going on here? And I left there disappointed. So they, no, sorry, there are no institutions. Even though they are in form of a building, they are not really effective. Okay. Yeah, so it's like they are just there in theory. Go ahead. So ask what uh, Sister Katie and uh, Beholi and um, Bimbo just said. Now, when you consciously do something, it's different from when you do not consciously do it when it just happened accidentally. Now, what Rehole said is that in the in the, in the Western world, uh, the, the the African pro proverb that we are talking about now has been systematically adopted and was not a village to raise a child. So we all have different views about this uh, proverb. Now we are proceeding to the main questions of today's program. So the first person I'm going to ask uh, is uh, Riholi, Riholi Bitata. And the, my question here is, how do you identify children with special educational and uh, edu educational needs, I would say, and their general well-being? And um, the way a child is diagnosed with uh, special needs it starts all the way in early years. So it's the early years setting that allows the adults working with those children uh, to identify problems with the way they um, engage with other children, they explore the world, speech and language is one, probably mathematical understanding as well, and how they uh, convey uh, the message. So those are the so those are the early stages, and at that stage, uh, parents are informed. Many parents, because they are the children are very young, they might not be able to identify anything that could be a problem in the long uh, term. However, it's the professional's responsibility to have that conversation and express those concerns with the parents. Sometimes it goes the other way around, where the professionals uh, see that there's nothing alarming or anything worrying in the child's behavior or progress. And on the other hand, is the parents raising their concerns? Could be because that child, when he's at home, behaves in a manner that is not um, acceptable or not recognized by the parents when the parents might compare that child in particular with other siblings or with someone else's child, because that happens a lot. Many parents compare their children to someone else's in terms of progress. So if my child is not doing this, how come he's not doing this when so-and-so, who is the same age as him or her, is doing it? So that's that's when things can can begin in that sense. But at the same time, parents need to understand that just because your child is not doing the same things as other children doesn't mean that your child has special needs because children learn different ways and at different rates. When parents and schools are able to work together, I think it's the perfect scenario because then the parents and the, and the teachers sit down and they have a discussion and then they agree what the plan of action is going to be. And it's not only the teacher's responsibility to input what are they going to do with that child? The parents can also input, can also give, share their views and share their concerns and also give ideas because mm -hmm. teachers do not know it all, all and schools don't get everything right mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. When especially needs children are diagnosed at a later stage, which can be the case, either because it's been uh, overlooked by either parties, by both parties, is then things can get a bit, a bit 
complicated if it turns out that that need requires immediate attention and it has been completely overlooked. For instance, behavior. Behavior can be one of the triggers or one of the signs that tells professionals that that child might be suffering from some uh, some needs. And um, for some, might not be that a big deal, but it is a big deal because behavior gets in the way of that child's learning. And when behavior gets in the way of that child's learning, then that learning gets slows, that slows down and that progress in comparison to the other to, to the rest of the class can also be impacted. And then you start see disparities in 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 the level and the speed of progress between children. So when that happens, once again, the parents and the teachers need to sit down and in some cases they have uh, an individual in the educational plan needs to be drafted. And in that individual educational plan, so um, the targets need to be stipulated. How um, how are those targets going to be met? How long are they going to be met? Because just because your child requires special needs, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that your child is going to need a special needs uh, or support throughout his life. That could be a term, it could be for the school year, or it could be just for primary, and then by secondary, that child is working at expected levels. Yeah. If the parent doesn't agree with what um, the, um, the, the school says, the parent has the right to uh, have a chat with the head teacher, have a chat with, um, with a year form in secondary school, or even the, with, uh, with an independent board if, you, if the parents are not agreeing with what the school is saying. And in some cases, um, there are voluntary organizations that support parents in mediating with the schools as well. So special needs is very broad. It is very broad and uh, each special needs is different. When I was teaching, I had a big group of children with special needs and everyone had their own needs. One was more behavior and emotional. So we needed a psychologist and unfortunately we didn't have regular access to those type of professionals. When the children require um, help from outside the school, that's when the challenge really begins because professionals are, you know, very, there's a waiting list, first of all, especially when, um, when the demand is large, is so large. And then on the other, in the other uh, sense, you might have that the school doesn't, um, need, doesn't see the need for an external agency to come and support that child. And in some cases, it's down to money. Where is the money to pay for that professional to do those extra hours to support that particular child? Because in the school, you might have more than one child with that particular need. And then what happens? How are you going to cover the need of all those children? So I think I think I if if anyone has a question like direct, like very specific, probably am I able to break things down a little bit, but just as a broad explanation, mm. um, special needs is not something that is for life. It's not a sentence. Some parents might say, mm. Oh, my child has been uh, diagnosed with special needs. I don't want to hear it. And okay. there's denial, and that denial uh, phase can also cause delay in the support that that child is um, receiving. That what type of support, or whether that child's support receives any support at all. I remember in another school when a child in year six uh, actually was. Um, I think he came from Nigeria, probably two three years into the in in the country in the educational system, they found out that the child was deaf. So that child, throughout his through early years in Nigeria, up to probably year four, no one knew that that child was deaf, or if they knew, they pretended that there was nothing wrong with him. 
and okay, things okay. like that in that our community. That's a very good example. Just, okay. They just need to stop because there's a lot of denial. I remember another situation where there was this autistic boy in reception. The boy explored everything with his mouth. Babies do that. Pick up a pencil in the mouth, pick a, to a toy in the mouth. Children here in, in reception, four and five, they don't do that. It's not like something regular for them to, to learn things. And I remember that when the mother came to pick him up, she said, he needs discipline. She was a Nigerian mom, he needs discipline. And I was like, oh my goodness, complete denial. What happened to that child? I don't know, I don't know. But there are many cases like that where parents are in complete, complete denial. And I think that's cultural, thinking about what, the community is going to think what are the church are going to think what and it's all about me and how i look in the face of society as opposed as to how can i help and support my child so he has better chances of a more independent life and mm. that's what i would have to say yeah that's that's what i want to say <laughs> about, yeah. you know, about well, well explained. Well, well explained. Thank you so much. You know, uh, in most cases in the school system, they ensure that they identify the needs of the children and profound solution to it because they believe that early intervention will have huge impacts in the lives of those children. Miss Joyce, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear me. Can you hear me? Miss Joyce, can you hear me? Hello, Miss Joyce, can you hear me? I don't think she can hear you. Not yeah, she cannot hear me. I was about to ask her a question around the school system as a mm. headmistress, how they address the issue of abuse, abuse yeah. among children in the school system, and how they also assess children, identify their uh, peculiar needs, like what uh, Ariholi just uh, said. That is what I wanted to ask her. I want to compare it with the Western society or the school system, how they manage children, identify their needs, and also address those needs. That is what I wanted to ask. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not sure if she can hear me. Hello, uh, Ms. Joyce, can you hear me? Oh, no, I don't think so. So let's just uh, move forward. Before we go to the next question, I have one video to play. I want everybody to pay attention to this video. Um, what happened in Benesire lately? So oh, this is the part of what we are talking about. How do we provide services to children in African setting, in Nigeria, for instance? So I'm gonna play this video. Everybody should pay attention. After this video, we'll come back and analyze Picking and picking, no matter correction, no bit of do that kind of thing. Well, it's painful. We are sorry for what happened to this young boy, but I so much believe that young boy will get justice. I am very so sure, I am, I am very optimistic that, what's your brother's name? What's his son? What did he get for school? So that means it's not his father now. What are you bearing in the school? Okay, you are very pregnant. That means. The mother bought for another place. Maybe the mother don't want to come up for us. The mother don't want to come up for us. They need to arrest the woman because they are even saying that they have questions because the child was with you at all for two days. He did not cry out. Imagine your husband did that to your Your husband did that to your own son. You didn't keep quiet. You didn't cry out. You see people come and check him out. But I don't belong. The worst is pulling off just like that. I don't belong. 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 I don't bel
I know they give me my, if you want me go send me the side, but you don't be side side. Please, if not for the person that took his phone, I uh, have the video on the internet. Nobody will like just hear what's going on. Nobody will never. Also, because bless that lady that that record record uh, that that Okay, you take care of yourself, okay? Look for what you want to eat, eh? Okay, that's your mommy. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Oh, I'm not for you. Why you No, we don't shout. She said she did come for us. Now, from the they come. We go the. Okay, Okay, you be the my brother. Yeah, the brother. That be a friend. Okay, friend. The friend here. Madam, we just come from their office. Why they see us? But you say your friend did to to master. Madam, I want to ask a question. I beg they come back. Okay. Okay, you see what's happened to that young boy? How you see that camera? Yes, I see. I know Madam, how you see say you be house? See what thing happened to old picking we carry for Berlin? This is your husband. Carry knife and fire. Tell they beat your picking. You can't be her. I don't know how you feel. You can't, you know, even let people know, say, see what happened to this picking when I born for Belair. Oh, you just keep quiet for like this baby was with you at all for two days. You not talk anything. So say not be meaningful, uh, meaning Nigerians. Come the video the picking. That means if you leave and make it die for instance. I go die. You'll be in the Twitter okay. now. The two happen for night. Okay. And in me know that I run. I go by car. So when I take come mm. back, I meet her for crap. I said, Made and leave her. Me never knew, say, nah. But you say, it tire, my tire, hand, it tire, leg. When it tire, I meet and when it tire. So I said, Made and lose her. Me, she said, nah, normal tire, bit too strong. So when they lose her, now I take to the mark. I never see her. Now they break, now I meet the mark. Like that. Now I quarrel, say, the mark, not too much. So I have to go and call nurse to come and treat her. Understand? Even at that, you know, she said, they pour in for a body. Yes. They give her treatment. Nobody said, we will not treat her. It's my son. I cannot let anything harm any of my child because I, I pay pay before I born her. And that this man, nine trained his children. Forget about anything. You know, say when one thing is bad, when one thing is poor in this, uh, this country, they will use all of them. They will not look beside way pass. They will use it to overcome. As in the bad thing will cover the good one. And that man. Marry that man when that boy did. They and they want. They hear me so. Why didn't he? Why didn't this man did not kill them by that time? Understand? He trained him from KG1 to stand that way. Madam, what did this boy really do when they deserve that? Yeah, Madam, no matter how you take your time, we they talk about. Wait till the man do the picking now. Wait till he do this wrong. I don't want to you talk. It's not like a man sight of what she did. It's wrong. I still quarrel with her even the next day. It's wrong. If to see beaten for K, leave her. That is normal thing. But for I know say not temptation, say not devil. Because yeah. if the devil won't do work, he get the way he go enter person, he go say, do, do. do. So what he did is wrong. Understand? Madam, the question is, waiting your husband really tell you, say, this small picking, 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 this but that day, he eat finished. We went to fetch water in this compound. I fetch me, fed you, fetch. He says that day, you got play. What that way, what push you to someone KK for you to own her and collect money? Yeah. That's what bring the anger. So when they tell you to go and need that, I have to go and pick money to go and buy the charge card. So I have to pick money to go and buy the charge card. When I come back, I meet her for that. So I say, you should just. Missing. So the next morning, when I meet the injury, I quarrel with her. Due to my health, if they kill us, who will take care of me? Your husband. Yes. They are not killing him. They are not saying. There's a comment here. Okay, read comment. 
uh, David Ewere. Yes. He said, please ask this woman if Hello. we allow someone else to take this son away okay, to train him. Okay, madam. Madam, my name is Blessing. Save your ideas. Okay. So, wow. I'm just speechless, honestly. Rihali, I hope you understand the language. Did you? Not really. Not no. really? Okay. No. So maybe we'll explain to you a little bit. It's like this woman, she brought this child uh, to her new marriage. And the husband was abusing the child. According to the mother, the child was only a year and six months or something like that when she got married to the man. Now, I don't know what happened. They said the child is still in. You know, you can see the environment. Poverty is at the root of all this. For a little child to be still in, that child must be lacking many things at all. Mm -hmm. We should look at that. Uh, yeah. So this child is still in, and the stepdad uh, abused him. He tied his hands and legs and they stab him with a knife. Stab the little child with a knife. So who are intervening right now? Just go Samaritan. These are not social workers. They, these women who were interrogating her are mm. not child youth workers. They are not social workers. They are just good Samaritan from one uh, non-for-profit organization. They are trying to intervene. You can see their reaction. They are not doing so much, so much to address this issue because they are not coming from a supported institution by the government. So I know that um, Ms. Katie Salami, can we still hear you? Oh, no, not really. Not really. Uh, okay, let me bring Bimbo to the picture here. Bimbo, please, just tell us. As a, a child youth worker yourself, how will you address this situation? What just uh, happened? What happened to that little child? Okay. Um, <laughs> what you just saw in that video sort of um, represent everything we have been talking about. We're talking about cultural differences. And we can see the woman in tears. And um, you can imagine where she's coming from. So the issue of stigma here, it comes in again. She knows she's struggling with the child. She's not going to ask for support. She's not going to. Because she doesn't want to be seen as a failed mother. Right? Sorry, can I, can I just disagree with you on that? I would disagree. The reason, the reason you say she cannot ask for support is this. Does she know if the support is available? Has somebody told her exactly. there is a support? Has somebody educated her to say that if your child, if you are not, if you are struggling in this area, this is where you come from. I grew up in Benin City. I actually grew up very close to welfare in Benin City, very close to welfare in the area, area in Benin City. So we used to know when we were growing up. When I was a young child, we used to know that there are certain things you walk straight to the welfare and the welfare officer will take care of you. Does this woman know that? Has anything be, has this okay. woman been educated? Okay. That's it. We can't just assume, let we cannot generalize. Okay. okay. Let me let me answer your question. Yeah, one thing I also <laughs> observed about the woman is, is like she was also trying to defend the man, the husband by saying that the man helped her to raise the child, and this, this, da, da, da. But at the same time, raising the child does not really justify you abusing the child brutally like that, using knife to stab okay. the child. You know, that is what Can those women do. Yeah, okay, go ahead. She tried to defend the man. She didn't pose as somebody that actually need help or that is struggling with the child. For you to be helpful to somebody, that person has understand where on. Sister Katie, uh, Nekma, if I understand where Sister Katie was coming from, mm. is that you are looking from you are looking at the mother that needs help. It's not just the child right now. Before we start talking about the child, we need to focus on the parents right now. 
the parents need help. First and foremost, the man got anger, anger management issue. The man needs to be to be taken for, for some therapy. He needs to learn how to manage his emotions. Then the mother needs to build confidence because she brought that child to that home when the, when the child was just a baby. Now she is mm -hmm. relying on that man. The man has been the breadwinner of that family. Now, whatever that man says goes from her point of view, from her belief system, from her cultural view. Her husband is the breadwinner. She is the, he's the man of the house. Whatever he says goes. This is exactly what I said earlier. When you have been brought up in that culture where the way things are done, it takes a long time for you to change people's belief system. A belief system is something that you are you grow up with when you what you were trained to believe when you were a child. That woman, that's a belief system. I believe now the man is a messiah, is a messiah. The man is the man, the breadwinner of the heart. So whatever he says goes. So he has the authority to beat, kill anybody in that family, and nobody will ask. Now, my question is this: if we say that Nigeria is still adopting that culture of a child is uh, it takes a village to raise. What happened to the neighbors? What happened to the people around there? Why didn't somebody say, stop doing this, or we will call the police? Why did nobody not say that, okay, I think the poverty in this family is beginning to be too much. These people need help. They can't look after their children. Why didn't any, any of anybody step in? And now, another thing I also picked up in that video was like, when those people came in, to come and to come and interrogate the mother. The day the mother came in, the first thing they were they were, they were shouting. They were they, they, they were antagonizing that woman. Of course, you will be threatened. You want to defend yourself. You don't want to get into trouble. Every mother will do that. The first point of contact would have been: Look, we are from Good Samaritans. This is what we do. This is what we do. We have people. Did you tell them what you do? Did she know whether you are a detective? You are coming to arrest her. Did she know whether you are going to take her child away from her? She know you were offering her, offering her help. She didn't know that. All of this were not discussed. You see what I mean? This is where I say that for us to, to address this kind of issue, it has to come from the top. Mm, exactly. It has to come from the top. The education has to be there. Parent, like Revali uh, uh, really said earlier, I picked to that because that's my job. That's what I do. When you diagnose a child that the child has uh, autism, if you read one of my, some of my articles that are published uh, uh, or my case studies, if you diagnose a child that the child has autism, a woman will say, a Nigerian woman will say, in Jesus' name, my child don't have autism. But it takes time for me to educate that woman what it means to have autism, what autism means. It takes time for me to educate the parent that, look, we are not trying to do anything here. We are not labeling your child. We want to help. It takes time for the woman to actually understand that where I'm coming from is help. I'm coming from a place of help, not a place of judgment, not a place of pointing finger, a place of judgment. If you don't do that, this is that culture, the belief system, it's not gonna change. Not if the parents can trust you 100% that you're actually offering help. You're not judging them. You're not antagonizing them. You're not trying to point finger at them, that they are poor. That they can raise, they can look after their child. You have to offer help and make it look like it's help. Then they'll take it from you. When you are not offering it, they can't take it from you. I still seriously believe that this all boils down to the uh, uh, issue of stigma. A typical African parent, even at the point of death, we never agree, apart from issues of poverty. Apart from them seeing dollars or nairas with you that you have naira or dollars to present to them. Other than that, they will never agree that they are struggling with their children. I just want you to, to note that. So well, we never agree that they are struggling with their child. Until the point that the child is caught in armed robbery and is at the point of facing the firing squad. That is when the mother or the father will lament, hey, I've been going through this issue, so that is where the parent will break down. Other than that, they will never agree that they need help. This is the child who is stealing. I am not justifying what the stepdad did, but before he did that, we can imagine the, the, no, the, the, um, the amount of time this child has been caught stealing out of frustration. Again, that is not a justification for what he did. 
But even at the first time, the second time, they had the opportunity to start talking to persons, even though there are no systems in place because we are easy to blame these things on systems. But at least talk to people, talk to people around and let them know what is happening. Then they don't talk. Because you see, there's a stigma. In this part of the world, when families are going having crisis, especially parenting conflict, they are the first to call on, like, you know, Children's Aid Society or any child welfare organization asking for help. Even if we have those things in Nigeria, they will not because they see that as a stigma. Uh, Mrs. Miss Bitata just said something about a Nigerian child that came to UK who was six years old and was uh, having well, issues with hearing. Maybe they moved the, the I know there are there are centers for the deaf, even the the city there. They have. Needless to talk about Lagos and other uh, other states, but the mother or the father, the parents never ask for help. They kept it to themselves. For you to procure solutions, there has to be problem. And if you don't say what the problems are, how do people work towards a solution? How do people work towards a solution? Yeah, it's so almost, the well, almost the same thing like what Mrs. Sosa said. Exactly. That, uh, so in the Canadian context, I know you also asked as a social worker, you know, how can I come in, you know, to, to support, right? Yes, for me, we, for me I becoming, hold, this is hold, becoming very, very interesting. Oh, this is hold, becoming okay. very, very interesting. Can uh, I just say something just quickly? Finish. Just finish. Before, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this Go is ahead. this is becoming very interesting, and I like it. <laughs> so, okay. let me say something. We keep yeah. talking about institutions, institutions, mm -hmm. institutions. Remember our orientation, how we were brought up, like I earlier said. We are product of our environment. The way we were brought up, we are still kind of stuck in those days. You understand? I'm not saying that these institutions will not help. They will go a long way to help. But we cannot compare it to the Western world. This is what works for them here. And what works for them here may not necessarily work for us back home. Say, for instance, um, apprehension of children into, into care. Can you just imagine as a parent in Nigeria, your, the, 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 the crisis comes to a point where a social worker or a child protection worker have to apprehend a child from the home in Tokyo and say, you cannot have access to this child again. Eh? One, two, three, family. Don't you think heads will roll? Can you imagine that kind of situation? Do you think that will work? Do you think that will work? Okay, coming back to the video that we just watched, you saw that woman, although she's not... Um, a social worker, she's not a professional, she's she's not she's an NGO, right? She works for an NGO, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she works for an NGO. So I'll still see them as a professional body. Did you see she was almost at the point of leaving before the mother of the child now came in? Is she supposed to leave? Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's yeah, because I'm sick of, because it's not, we are, that's we are, what we said earlier, Bimbo, that this woman, she's just playing this role of a good Samaritan. She's not a good okay, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Please now, Sister Sosa, Mr. Sosa, before you jump on me, even here, when you find a situation like that, eh, you cannot walk away from that situation. And you as professionals, I don't know how it works in UK, in Spain or in America, in Canada, you can be fined one thousand dollars. You can be fined one thousand dollars if you don't do the needful in a situation like that. The child is not you, you are not the parent of the child, or you are not related to the child, or, but because you are a professional and that woman is an NGO, what's my NGO? So I still consider her as a professional, and you walk away from a situation like that without um doing something at least, or at least even calling the police. Okay. Because there's right. criminality in this as well. Okay. You can be fined a thousand dollars. But okay. we saw her, she was almost walking away from the scene before the mother came. Is she supposed to walk out of that place? Here in the Western world, the professional will wait or at least call somebody or at least just do something. Call the police. Okay. I mean, yeah. make it. Can can you can't leave the child. We understand. You can't leave the child. Okay. Yeah. So can go I come ahead. in? Yeah, go ahead. Let me just take the uh, the scenario. 
Mm. about the Nigeria and let me apply it to sister the sister that just spoke you know mm. she has already uh, kind of put everything together for us but let me just analyze this just looking at the video if a case worker was to handle this case or a, uh, a social worker was to handle it like sister said 1000 in my California they go after your license and you know what that is. So we had set rules, we had guidelines, you know, that we cannot compromise our work at all. So, but if I were to be the one to handle that case, I will, this, I, this will be breaking down into three parts. I cannot go to someone's door without the police being there anyway, right, for safety reasons. So I'm bringing this to American standard, please bear with me. I'm not talking about Nigeria anymore because the services and resources are not available in Nigeria. So if this were to happen in America, and believe me, there's no perfect place, there's no perfect world, there's no perfect services, and there's no perfect parents. And this is where we come in. If this was to happen, mm -hmm. I see a mother that loves her son. I see a mother that struggles. And I also see a mother that loves her husband, okay? But the question is, if I'm doing a complete assessment, I want to find out where's the biological father, what was the situation of the child, how was the child born here? And then what is the history? Are this, do this particular uh, uh, family have a, 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 like a crisis? Uh, are they always in crisis for one thing or the other? And then again, the man has anger issue. Has this man ever been married before? How has he treated other stepchildren? Has the man, you know what I mean? So there's a whole lot that has to go in it. Mm -hmm. Then we can offer services to the family, family unit. Of course, that child is taken away. We do not re remove one child. We remove the whole children under this parent care. And then the parents... Now, of course, it's going to go into CF, uh, CPS uh, report and CPS have to take report and then it will go into court. All right. The court will make them have a mandatory Tory training, they'll put them in a program where the both parents, of course, the dad probably doesn't want the child. The mother have to go to parenting class, have to, of course, there's DV, there's domestic violence in that kind of family. So they have to go to domestic violence for a number of time. And then in all of these, though, there are resources available to the parent. The goal of social services is to make a family as a unit and move forward. Again, the guidelines are Ignorance of the law is not an excuse. You cannot beat a child. Let me make an example with a little thing here. In California, if I discipline my child with a closed fist, right, I can be, I can be charged with abuse. If I discipline a child with open fist, there's a little way. If I pushed a child and the table hit the ground and there's injury, it's an abuse. OK, so our abuse in California is into categories. So if we go back to that scenario of that parent, the court have to get involved so that the parents will have that, do have that ability, the compulsory ability to attend the parenting class, the domestic violence and the anger problem. OK, of course, the children in her care are taken away. Children, when they are taken away, because the, the, the department one family unity, children don't do well in an unknown environment. So they will find a family member that are responsible, that is anger free, that have the ability to accommodate these children. So these, these children will be placed in that family home. If there is no family available, the children can go to emergency shelter. From there, they can go to foster homes. OK, so but before we don't we, we don't grab kids from an, a violent person and throw them in foster home because that foster home you're going might be worse than the parents that you took the children from to begin with. So the resources will be available. I'm sure this mother, all she need is to connect a dot so that she will have the basic resources to care for these children. You know what I mean? So in our in our own time, in our state where we are, services will be provided for them. Of course, the child will be taken care of wherever the child is placed. And then usually between six to nine months, if there's no change in the family, that's when the child will go into foster adoption. So you see how the system works. The system will make you as a parent change your lifestyle, change the way you discipline your child, and make you comply with the law of the land, period. Either that 
Oh, you forfeit your child, and then you go to jail for abuse. <laughs> Fantastic. You just summarized what I said earlier, uh, Miss Ketty, because you said it didn't. Need, we don't need the <laughs> government to do that. But you have absolutely just pointed out that what we need is the government to put something in place. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, that is what I've been saying, that uh, we need professionals to address this type of situation. You can see that woman there, she was just powerless. She was powerless addressing this issue because she's not coming from a government regulating body. So she's just playing a good Samaritan. It's like you see uh, a family abusing a child in the streets. What will you do? You just say something. And when we are accusing or uh, saying that we expected her to call the police, the question is whether or not is the structure of the society really supporting calling police? Can you just pick up your phone like in the West, you call the police and the police, or within a few minutes, the police will be right there with you. That is the question. Yes, definitely. Uh, when you look at what the complaints say about the child, uh, it is factual, even from the environment, that this child is living in extreme poverty and the, the stepfather seems to be a little bit strict to him. Mm -hmm. Because for you to abuse a child like this, and the child is not his, because the mother brought this child with her when she married to the man. It's just a stepson. Mm -hmm. So he's abusing him right now because of poverty uh, in the family. That is what I would say. It's because of the poverty. Because if that child is satisfied at home, I don't think a little child will go ahead and be still in the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So poverty is at the root of it. And moreover, the the institution, I will keep mm -hmm. saying, professionals are not there to regulate Thank the relationship you. between families and children and given that our african society like what i said earlier is gradually transiting from the communal family whereby the entire extended family the father the grandfather uh, everybody will be living in one roof we are not living like that anymore in africa you can see where this woman is living it's like she's living with her husband with the child she brought from her previous marriage or whatever and had the children she had for the man so they are living alone so when this man was abusing this child given that they are living a kind of an individualistic kind of family structure there's nobody to intervene we are even lucky that we are discussing about this child is her life the man can even kill the child during the process so right now like what we said earlier i'm trying to just connect it with that uh, proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child but i don't think it's still applicable to uh, modern day african society no it's not no, you it's can not. see the family structure it's, mm -hmm. from this video we can see so that like, yeah the family structure is not there anymore this is not yeah. in our family mm -hmm. anymore so do we really have institutions no, we don't. to address this our changing society the way we are raising our children uh, do we have it probably yes are they really effective no no, no. so uh, yeah, yeah i will bring uh, uh mr sosa go ahead thank you Nefme. thank you very much that was very very um very very informative and i like the fact that we're all able to bring a different perspective to the table and we are all able to address it and I think what, what actually transpired in this conversation was that uh, Sister Katie and Sister Bimbo, um, you were all saying exactly what me, what I was saying, mm -hmm. but um, you were addressing it from a different point of view. I think at the beginning of the conversation, you were like, we don't need the government, parents can do things. Whereas we do need the government to promulgate law for us to follow. When you raise a child in a home where there are no rules, the child will go outside in the society and break the rules because the child has been brought up in an environment where there are no rules. The child runs around the house, pick the television, do whatever the, the child likes and get away with it. Then expect the child to go outside and break the rules. That's exactly what it is. If the government don't put law in, pray, in place, parents are not worried. Nobody will be scared. Everybody will violate the law. Like you rightly pointed out, sister, Thomas, you said that in America you will be fined if you if you don't in Canada, in Canada you'll be fined you, if you don't abide by, by your ethics of your profession. When professionals don't have that ethics, 
They do whatever they like and they get away with it. Yes. Because yes. nobody is going to ask you. Do or, nobody is going to question what question you what you did right or did wrong. So the same thing applies to parents. If parents know that this is my child, I can do whatever I like to this child. They do whatever they like. Nobody is going to ask them. They they know somebody will come and question them and say, "You smack this child. You leave a mark on the child's body. Why did you do that?" Then they won't do it. Like Sister Katie said, it's the same in the UK. In the UK, you are allowed to smack your child. You are allowed to smack your child, but you are not allowed to leave a bruise on your yeah. child's skin. Yeah. If your child is bruised, then that's abuse. Yeah. You are not allowed to use some bad language. There are different kinds of abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, you know? Yeah. But when, when the law is not there to govern people, when yeah. people are raised without laws, they do whatever they like. But it's one of the guidelines I give to parents. If you want your child to be disciplined, create a ground rule in your a ground rule in your house, yeah. where you want them to eat, where you want them to drink, where you want them to put the cup. Because when you create a rule in your house, your children will grow up disciplined, and then they will go outside in the in the society. Know that the society is governed by rules. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And then they don't violate the law when they go outside. But children brought up in a home without without rules at home go outside the society and break rules because they'll be, they think that the life is free. You do whatever you like and nobody asks you. That's why you see children go outside and get arrested. They break the rules all the time. I raised two boys in the United Kingdom. Oh. It takes a strong parents. It takes rules. I don't shout. I've never smacked my children. No, I don't shout. The way I said it, that's how it goes. Because they were trained to listen. They were trained to know that in my house, there are rules. You've got to be home seven o'clock. You have to be home seven o'clock. So when you go outside and you drive, you have to know this is a way you cannot drive to. This is where you can drive to because there are rules in the society. A society without rule, a lawless society, that's what Nigeria is. It's exactly. a lawless society. Mm -hmm. So parents don't have any rules that guide them. Professionals don't have any rules that guide them. And nobody answers to anyone. Everybody do whatever they like and they get away with it. Uh, you know, what you just said now, I'm afraid that that child at the end of the day will be left alone, you know, to bear this burden of his uh, stepfather abusing him because we cannot see any intervention all that much from the society because these women who were just there trying to ask questions, interrogate the mother, they will just do that for a few minutes and walk away while this child will still be in that family. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think okay. so. Okay. Do you think they will take it more than that? What they well, just I, I know before uh, uh, Mrs. Oyehen uh, left the Department of Social Services in Nigeria, Issues like this, she will send a representative there and the kid will be take, brought back to her office and they will find a place for the child. That was Ms. Sohen at that time. I don't know what the present situation is in Nigeria, but I know for sure that social media is a big thing that is rescuing abused children from their parents. So I believe that the kid will not be left in the care of their mother, of that parent. I know the child will be taken away. I'm, I'm very sure. Yeah. Since the uh, NGO are involved, there is a, I mean, it's a government-funded NGO anyway, so there's, there has to be some kind of intervention. Not, not, not government-funded NGO? No. Some of them are. Government are giving them stipend anyway. Oh, okay, but the one... And some of them that I know personally, the government are supporting in some areas for them. Oh, okay. So but this yeah. one is not a government. Uh, okay. Not, so, uh, but I'm just uh, assuming they're not just going to talk to the mom and leave the child there. They got to be something has to be done. So I just wanted to make some corrections, though. Mm. Although uh, there is little thing in place because I have tried to do some volunteer work anytime I'm in Nigeria. There, there are there are system in place. It's just not really working yet because it's not consistent when anytime there's a change of government everything has changed so there's that consistency is not there yes. so even when you start something the next four years somebody else comes in they throw you out of there mm -hmm. that department is closed depending on your connection that's so i think that's a major that's problem slow. we are having there is a system is not consistent with the, the people managing it exactly. so yeah, so so it's always like change government, mm -hmm. APC come, and then mm -hmm. APC is there, PDP come, everything APC is thrown away. Mm -hmm. So 
it just there's no consistency there's no continuity of mm -hmm. care to mm -hmm. pick up from where the prior mm -hmm. person left mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. so i think god i don't want us to have this notion that there's something is happening in nigeria mm. it's just mm. not enough and i'm just hoping because i was one of those that says oh god if i have to do anything in that country i won't now i'm changing my mind because they need us i'm telling you so if every one of us in this forum can really find an avenue where we can get connected to the department where we specialize on and see how we can help Please, let's do it. Next yeah. man, if you can coordinate that for all, we can sign up. Anytime <laughs> we're in the country, right? Yes. Or yeah. we need the security so that uh, we will not be kidnapped. Come on, I was going to say, if they <laughs> kidnap the cobble, I don't have. So <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was in, I was in Nigeria in, in, in uh, March this year. I visited a lot of schools in Bidin City. I visited yeah. a lot of uh, special schools in Bidin City. And I can say the governor is actually doing a very good job in Bidin. Uh, mm -hmm. I visited the uh, because Rehole mentioned the child that was deaf in Nigeria came to the UK. Mm -hmm. I actually went to the uh, school for the deaf children in Benin City. I went to school Benicity. for children with, uh, uh, with 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 you know with severe severe complex needs in Benin City. And I think he's doing a wonderful job. Yes, there's still more work to do. Like you said, uh, uh, Sister Katie, there's still more work to do. But they are doing they are doing something. They are doing something. More work to be done, but they are doing something. That's so, it. yeah, yes, well, because we are not able to connect with uh, uh, Joyce, Miss Joyce, she's a headmistress in a mm -hmm. secondary school in uh, in Benin. I spoke with her a little bit yesterday because I had network is very bad. Uh, we can't connect. With, I wanted her to come and say this again. I was asking her questions around how they regulate children. If, for instance, a child is experiencing abuse in the school system, how would you address this? She told me that her first step is to take the child to a clinic, treat the child, and uh, work with the parents to know what happened uh, to the child, why they are abusing the child, something like that. Okay, I was expecting her to say, okay, they will also refer the child or the family to a social worker or a social worker coming in or child protection worker coming in. Just nothing like that from no. her comments. You understand that. So, you know, if I can come in on the abuse case, mm. uh, when you say professional addressing this issue, I believe every one of us here, if you are in a, if you are in the uh, mental health setting or a clinician, we are mandatory reporter. If mm -hmm. I see a child, right? I mean, I'm not on the street. See a child that is being abused. No, that's what. No, what I meant. In my own facility that I work, there are times when the child goes to the hospital to be treated. The doctor does not report it, right? And then the child will come to the school. The school might miss it. If the child happens to come to my department, I'm reporting it. And then the CPS will now investigate and find that initial, initial contact was with the doctor. So what happened? Initial contact was another contact was in the school. What happened? Another contact was with me. But we are, Kate, you are going back to talk about a country where there are laws, there are rules, there are, there, know, there are policies. Saying, I, I know, but I'm just trying to, to also with our audience who are listening that, you know, things like this, we, we, people don't get away with it. People don't get away with it. So, no. again, like you said, it's Isosa, of course, the system has to really be in place in Nigeria. Yes. But in the outside world, though, you know, someone has to make this report. You can have multiple reports and then the Department of Social Services, oh, this case has been reported again. Well, Mr. Lamy, we've already investigated it. They don't need to tell me the outcome of the report, but it's my own obligation to be sure that there's a report in place. That's what I was just trying, that's my input in it. Outside, the, pro okay. outside the professional world, for instance, I, as a human being, we all have uh, the moral obligation to report such case, you understand? In case you encounter a child being abused by the parents, we all have the moral mm -hmm. obligation to intervene and depend on the country where you live, like in a kind of African setting, like what just happened in Nigeria, that uh, it's not possible for them to really call police because of the system. But in the West, 
per se. You will, the first thing is to call the police to intervene. Then the police can work with other professionals to address this uh, issue. So it depends. We as human beings, we all have the moral obligation to intervene no matter what country you are in the world. So uh, let me quickly bring Ms. Josie. Let her also explain to us about her experience, given that she's a headmistress in a primary school or secondary school in Nigeria. Hello, uh, Ms. Joyce, can you hear us? Um, can okay, you hear me? I can yes. hear you. Listen, I have to ask you mm. this question. In case of abuse, for instance, uh, in your school, you are a headmistress in a primary school or secondary school in, in Benin City. Hello? Can you hear us? Yes, ma. Okay. Are yes, ma. Are you a headmistress yes, in the primary school or secondary school? I don't want to make that mistake. Okay, I am headmistress in a, in the primary school. Okay, okay. If for instance, I'm headmistress in primary school. Okay, yeah. listen carefully. Listen to my question right now. Okay, if for instance a child comes to school with bruises, um, uh, his or her skin, how will you address the situation? Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Neckman. Yes, when a child ahead. comes to school with bruises all over our body, the first thing to do is to receive the child, first of all. Depending on the nature of bruises, you first of all pick up the child, make sure the child is okay. Then next, you have to look for the cause of that action. What actually led to that bruises? Does that mean that the child was abused physically by someone? Or does the child have an accident on his, on his or her way um, when he or she was coming to school? You have to look for the cause of that bruises first. After looking for the cause, if paraventure is physical abuse by a guardian or anybody, you need to put a call across to the person. So ask the person to come, find out what actually happened before you can take further actions on that. Okay. So if, for instance, it Time. happens that... So if that for, instance, listen, for the call, listen, yes. listen, listen, let me go forward with this okay. question. If, for instance, it happens that the parents, one of the parents uh, abused the child, how will you intervene? And you also realize that the abuse is so intense that that child or the family might be posing threats to the life of that child. How will you go forward and support this child? Okay, thank you very much. In Nigeria setting, what we do here, if we discover that a parent is the one that inflicted that bruise on the child, the first thing to do, I will invite the parents over. I had a similar scenario about a mother that flogged a son to the extent you can see the marks on the child's body. You can see the red marks all over the child's body, including the head. And I can remember vividly what we did that day was to invite the parents immediately. We invited the parents and we asked her what led to this. And she was trying to justify her point that the child did something wrong. And we told her, do you know this is physical abuse? You just abuse the child. Because without the child cannot learn. The child is already emotionally down. And she tried to explain what the child did. And what we did, I told her, I'm going to report the case to police. If there will be any other occurrence to this, this kind of issue, if there is anything like that again, we're going to we are going to invite the police, reporting this kind of issue to the police. And she actually apologized. And we asked her to take the child home, take the child to the hospital, and take care of the child. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. I have a question. Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So my question, ma'am, is, mm. so you invited the parents and you believe the parents because they apologize to you. What if there are other children in the home that have been abused just like this? So how would you know? So you guys never send nobody out there to see there are other children oh. that have been abused or molested <laughs> or in danger, exactly. right? So 
Then what okay. they follow us? Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. So that's my okay. question for you, ma. <laughs> okay, ma. Okay, ma. Thank you very much. In that aspect, because this one we got is an evidence. We have an evidence already. What I did then, I remember the, the former health teacher, the former, the former head mister did something. He asked the woman to write an undertaking. There are similar issues. Maybe the woman, the woman, ah, uh, she's just kind of out. Uh, she's very hot. We try to investigate the woman. We try to put the woman in a condition. We talk to her in such a way. We told the woman that, madam, on no account, should you raise your hand on the child when you are angry because you are, you are hot tempered. So, what we did at that time is to put an eye on that parents. If there is another occurrence of such, she will be reported to the police. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Jersey. Uh, yeah, I will, yeah I will, you will jump in. Let me just quickly uh, just say something about that. You can see it's crystal clear to all of us right now that the difference is clear here. The difference is clear. Okay. In such case in the West, we'll be addressing different way, completely different. So <laughs> that is just the reality of things in Nigeria. That is the reality of things. That is how they can address such uh, situation in Nigeria. Unlike in the West, per se, you know, in such situation, we are expecting the social work, the school social worker to intervene <laughs> because we have a social worker already there in, in the school system, working there. Uh, in most uh, uh, elementary schools here in Canada, we have social worker coming to the school. They even have their own offices you know, in the school premises. So they intervene immediately. The even social worker will be the first person to call in the school to intervene. The social worker will take it from there, from the teacher. But you can see how different it is. This is exactly the purpose of this program, to compare, to compare this cultural, you know, way of raising children in African setting with that of the West. So yeah. Uh, Mrs. Sosa, quickly jump in there. B -boy, you <laughs> thank B -boy, you, thank you, you B -boy, My you question, come. I was going to ask uh, the lady who just spoke. Uh, was it Joyce? Joyce, Joyce, I was going to ask Joyce a question. My question is, you said you will report to the police. Other than the police, do you have anyone else to talk to? Or you said you will, you will, you will, you will ask the parents, and you just take the parents' word for it. Just because they say, because the parents say that I didn't. I didn't do this, or I promised not to do it again. You just take a word for it. Yeah, you... Yeah. No, no, when you look at this situation, you cannot question Jersey too much because it is the structure of the society. It you understand? is the structure. So for her, she was not trained to work with other professionals. Mm -hmm. when such a situation oh. yeah in such a situation or to address such case she was not trained to understand that so you can't question her too much you can't mm -hmm. ask her too much question she just said exactly the reality of things in nigeria in the school system so that is it that is just it i because i don't think she will say anything more than that and yes that is what she said you understand mm -hmm. that is how she was trained so mm. it's the system. So that is why we should, you know, we are comparing today and we should also respect the cultural differences mm. of raising children because we live in the West. We cannot just be using our Western ways of life or yes. uh, the structure, the cultural structure and mm. the, the services that, that are valuable here to evaluate that of Nigeria because it's different. Despite that, we are gradually adopting the Western ways of life in, in okay. many African uh, countries. However, the difference is clear here. So, yeah, I think Josie really don't have any question to answer from us anymore. She has said it, <laughs> and uh, that is the reality of pain mm. in Nigeria. Mm. And we should also respect that. What we should be doing right now is how we can pull this to the forefront of the leaders. So let them understand that, look, this our society is no more this society of a, it takes a village to raise a child anymore. We have transited. You know, it's a whole parable. Interject so that, uh, okay, let me just quickly interject. I'm going back to that video. I have the video playing in my mind. In that video, mm. I just hope that 
uh, the child that is stealing is a cry for help. Mm. Indirectly bringing attention of the world to that family. And that mother that injured and abused that child, the man might also be a perpetrator for mm -hmm. sexual molestation. I'm not mm -hmm. saying those are the area I will also evaluate. Mother is sandwiched in and she's supporting the husband. I wonder what else is that man doing if there's any child that is a female in that family. So I'm just hoping, the reason I'm talking, I'm hoping it will go out there so that the NGO that came will really go back there again, maybe revisit that family. Because mm. children who are, this child that is stealing, regardless of what is being provided, it's a cry for help for attention to a family. So besides that physical abuse, is there any sexual molestation that is going on in that family? That's really what I want to say. Look, eh, that video is just a, a case study for oh, us okay. to understand that such case, eh, if this is not the only one, which means there are lots of similar cases you know, in the country. So I just played that video as a case study that we can use and apply it so this is our discussion today. So you understand that. Okay. So we really don't know. There's no investigation. We don't know what happened after that intervention from that NGO. What happened after that? We are not sure. But for me, I'm afraid that that child might be left alone under this yeah. abusive stepfather who is a maniac abusing this little child. I'm afraid mm -hmm. because I cannot see anything showing uh, those women that intervene, even trying to call police or there's no, no, no. There, we don't really have many professionals in this field to address the situation. For no. me, I believe that at the end of the day, this child will still be left alone. I, I have and then my other question is going <laughs> back, I just don't want to forget before I give the uh, the my colleagues uh, the <laughs> stage. My other question <laughs> is um, it takes a village to raise a child. I think that thing will work in a healthy environment. And let me give you uh, what happened in my family. I have a stepbrother who was very defiant. And uh, my dad is militant. So we grew up, I grew up in an environment where if my dad were to be in this country, that man would end up in prison. <laughs> so I grew up in an envir environment where we think my dad was a mini god. You know, so everything he says goes. But when I really sit back to evaluate, my dad was only you because he married seven wives. How can you you marry seven wives and I teach children? You are not there, he was into politics and running around the country looking for money. And the parents were the one parenting the children. So what this man would do became militant so that everybody would be afraid from the children to the wife, they all stand still when they might drive, you know, drive up uh, uh to the house. So, but my stepbrother. The, the way they discipline mother say, oh, he does this, he does that, he can't obey the rules, he's bringing shame to the family. They went to contracts with my uncle who were in the army, about four of them brought a, a bulala. And they really trashed this boy at that time. They beat him to stupor. And then the mother uh, cut the skin and they put pepper in it. You know, it happened to my brother and that boy although he's late now when i really think about it you know that was traumatizing if you were to be alive the question is what kind of a, a parent will he be you know if you were to be alive won't that man be angry is he going to use the same yastic that they used in him just to beat him into compliance is he going to use that for his own children won't that be considered serious abuse? Didn't this child need help? I'm very happy. I'm, you know, I mean, I'm saying this now because when I really have a reflection of my own family, you know, thank God for the kind of mother that I have. My mom will walk away from that marriage if you, be, if you beat any of her children. But the other mother did it no better. My mom is the youngest wife. She has some uh, education. So that education kind of uh, streamline her. So, oh, no, you can't beat my child like that. So just leave us. We'll go back to our village where we came from. You know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm... So it doesn't... You know, raising... It, it takes a village to raise a child. In that situation, it was very detrimental. It was not helpful. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Can I say something, that, man? I uh, think when we say... Let me quickly bring Bimbo there. I'll bring you mm -hmm. in. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. 
First of all, let me quickly clarify that the, the headmistress that spoke, Miss uh, Onwa, huh? mm. or uh, sorry if I say your name wrongly. First of all, if that was to be in Canada, the way pride, uh, child protection is done here, mm. the parent of the child can actually sue you and that parent will win because you are not trained to ask those kind of questions. I just want to clarify that. So coming to our topic, uh, about uh, community raising a child and all that, and uh, Africa trying to drift away from our traditional ways of raising kids and all that. I am not um, a diehard supporter of the Western culture. I am not, sorry to say, I might be sounding very archaic here. Uh, I still, yeah, Mrs. Zesosa is shaking her head. Thank goodness, I, we are now friends on Facebook. We are not <laughs> going to end it yet. We are going to continue oh, later. No, no. <laughs> we are going to continue. <laughs> so, because we keep talking about adopting the Western cultures, even the Western culture itself is very problematic. And a lot of them are even having problems with their own culture, okay? So, like uh, Mrs. Katie said, that every system is flawed in its own ways. So I think what we Africans should be looking into is uh, adopting the good ones that will favor us. And those ones that will not favor us, we should just uh, let throw go. them away. Yeah. Oh, let go. Hmm. When it comes to raising kids, I don't think we are quite ready for the Western way of raising kids. We are not ready at all. So let's go back to the drawing board where we do have extended family members involved. Let's go back to that. That's still the best. Like, I think we cannot we... go back. We can, unfortunately, Wait, I am we cannot now. go back because the Wait, globalization is a, is a trend finish. that you cannot stop. What globalization go to do with resi? Let me let me finish, it, please. It has so a lot of let impact. Me finish. Let me finish, oh. please. Okay. Even in this part of the world, I did a case. I did a case for it was a very popular case. I will not even give. Say, say more about the case because I think it kind of went viral in Canada and then Ontario and then to be specific in GTA where I live, it was in the news. So this child, how it happened, he was 10 years old. He was living with his stepmother and biological father. He was abused, being abused in the house, not visible in the school system, in the community, he was at home. Guess what? How we got the report? It was an extended family member that was living with them that brought the report to our attention. An extended family member that brought the report to our attention. If that family member was not living with them, there is no way we could have known. And immediately that case came to us and somehow immediately the parents, I mean the father of the child, got to know that I actually made that first call to the family. And I was to go and see them the following day. Just before that uh, appointment, we received a call from the police that that child has been killed and dumped in the street of that community. <sighs> yes. <sighs> and how did we even get involved? It was because there was a family member. I mean, an extended family member that was living with them. According to reports, the stepmother was scared because the biological father threatened her not to say anything. Her children were in the home. They would go to school. But this particular stepson of hers was in the house. Don't go out. Always locked in. I don't know all that things that are attached to it. Maybe there's mental health issues. or I didn't know because I didn't have the opportunity to meet with the child before he died. Just immediately the, pair, the father knew that we were involved. He did what he had to do. Not known to him that it is somebody, an insider, that made that report, who later came out on the stand to witness what happened. So that child that went to school with other bruises or other, okay, let me not even talk about that child. The other one that the stepfather used the iron rod and all that. Do you think if there was an extended member, as a family step, uh, as a, as a, an, an extended family member, just like grandmother, grandfather, uncle, you know how grandparents can be very protective of their children. 
Do you think yeah. that will happen? Yeah. Do you think they that will happen? It. I remember when so we, we are were not ready. Those days. We are not Nobody really can ready. abuse one child like that in front of the uh, how many family exactly. members in one big house in exactly. one house at that time. You cannot try that. No. So it's because it's of so, this type of family structure. So we are not that, ready. We are not ready for all this uh, Western adopt kinetic. I just it's, it's, it's ne, ne, I don't know. Okay, we're yes. not ready. Okay then. Yeah, thank you, Bibo. Thank you, Bibo. Thank you, Bibo. Go ahead. Bibo, thank you very much. Now that we are friends of Facebook, like this, <laughs> yeah, we are going to continue with this. Huh? I'm coming to Facebook and <laughs> talk about it. Like, what, what, what I define, yes, as uh, it takes a village to raise a child is that I grew up in Benin. I, I, I'm very proud of my roots, I'm very proud of where I come from. I grew up in Benin. When I where I grew up in, my, in Benin is that I, we lived in my grandfather's house. My grandfather, my, my, my dad's brothers, my, were married. So me and my cousins, 15 cousins, boys and girls, grew up together. That we would all sit down in the, in the living room, we would all eat together. And it, sometimes it depends who is cooking. If your mom is cooking this weekend, your mom will bring the food. Everybody eats it together. We all share the food together. And you come back from school, it could be your mm -hmm. uncle that's going to be helping you with your homework. It could be your dad that's going to be helping you with your homework. It could be your, your uncle who is a teacher that's going to help you with your homework. So for me, that's what it takes a village to, to raise a child. You don't really know who is your mother. Your auntie is your mom. Your mom is your, it's, it's just mom who goes to market and come back whenever she likes. Your auntie is your mom, you know, because your auntie is young and your auntie is the one that when she's going out, she dresses nice, she takes you out. You know what I mean? That's the kind of environment where I grew up, where everybody was accountable. It wasn't just my mom and dad that were accountable for me. It was everyone. When you bring your results home from school, if before your dad gets home, your uncle has already seen your results. And your uncle will be the one that will tell your dad that, look, she didn't do very well in biology, or she didn't do very well in this. Or your uncle is going to say, look, she did very well this time. You know, she deserved a present. See what I mean? That's what I mean. Well, that's what it takes a farm, a, a, a village to raise a child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, like Nick said, we have drifted away to that from that. Nobody's accountable anymore. Even if people live with their aunties or their uncles, nobody actually cares to talk about what is good for that child or the way you are treating this child is not good or the way you are doing this to this child is not good. Nobody, then there is no that accountability anymore. That's yeah, yeah. what. That's where we are. We, we we have we have drifted away from, and to, to kind of support you, Miss Thompson, what you said earlier that we are not ready for Western culture yet. No, we are not, because that's why I said that we don't have that system in place. Why do we think that we can adopt what the Western culture are doing when they have something in place? We are not ready for that. We and need to go back to our roots. We need to start teaching our children. The way we were taught, but however, yes, however, yeah. although we are not ready for that, for that transition, but we can have something in place. We can have laws. We can have rules to govern people. We can have rules to say that if your child does not come to school five days, I have right to come and visit you and ask you why your child have missed school. If your if your if your child comes to school with bruise, we have right to come and visit your house and check why your child have bruises. That does not mean that I am saying that we need to adopt if we're Western culture. That's not what I'm trying to say. But we need to have rules and regulation in place to, to monitor, to protect children. Child protection should be in place. We should have that in place. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. I'm not saying that we need to adopt Western culture. We need to do this. Fully I'm adopting it. Fully adopting it is different from you know adopting yes. the Western culture because yes. we cannot fully adopt because we have no, some of our cannot. African cultural uh, yes. traditions that are very important in terms of raising children. Even in the West, even in the West, they they will tell you. I remember working in one uh, shelter. Children that came from Nigeria, directly from Nigeria with their parents, in the morning, they are so different in the shelter. In the morning, we say, good morning, ma, good morning, sir. You will know that this child just came from Africa. Child, a child born and raised in Canada will not see you in the morning telling everybody Hi. good morning, ma. good morning, sir. So those traditions is what we cherish about raising children in African setting. You understand? Yes. But, however, 
at the same time, we need to protect these children by also yes. regulating the relationship between children yes. and our people in the streets, their parents, and everywhere. That is what we are advocating for right yes. now. That yes. yes, Africa can kind of raising children is not bad at all because even in the West, they still cherish those traditions. However, we need more regulation. More regulation. Even the children. Western world, let me just to add, they are adopting our culture. Yes. They are they are taking our culture and modify it to their standards, and they are doing better at it than we are doing. Yes, yes. So you need more regulation, like yes. what just happened to that little child that the stepfather abused. The father, uh, the stepfather should face the wrath of the law because we cannot just allow him he's a predator for me that man is a predator and is he might also be posing threats to other children you know we don't know so that man for me i would say he's a predator miss thompson the disagreement that i had with you was that you said that parents in nigeria Thomas. parents do go and seek help they 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 they, they are denial they are they are they don't want to seek help what I disagree with with you on that point, let me clarify that. I disagree that they don't want to seek help. They no intentionally don't want to seek help. It's because they don't know where the help is and they are not educated on how to seek help. It perhaps, perhaps, like I give an example, it took me a long time to educate a Nigerian parent or that I'm coming from a place of support. Perhaps if we educate them, perhaps if we have something in place and we educate them and say, look, this is the support that we have in place for you. And parents understand that this is actually support. Perhaps they will assess it. That's where oh, I disagree with you. Okay. Come on that point, please. Uh, uh, they know how to seek support. Let me come on that point. They will never Ms. open Thomas. up. Miss Thomas. Okay, let me come on that hey. point. <laughs> let me come on that point. Um, denial. We, uh, you know, denial sometimes is helpful for our being. Okay, it's only when we keep denying that is, it becomes an issue. Denial is an element that can give us that stability to be able to know, okay, the shame part of it is over, now I can go for help. Again, Sister Isosa, like you said, it all depends on the way that you present it to that person. Denial is good. It's a good thing. We just have, don't have to stay in it for so long. In Nigeria society, the, the culture is about shame, uh, degrading, and so many things because that's the society. So it's so hard for people that are in need to come and meet you and say, Sister Isosa, I have a problem. Okay? So they have to, you, like you said, you are a professional. You have to present it. You have to educate them. They have to trust you enough to tell you the issue of needs. So please let us understand that. And Sister, uh, Ms. Sister Thomas, in your own case where you said people, only a family that reported it. The family reported it because he or she lives in the home. And it just out of the goodness of his or her heart. And then at that point also, who knows what would have happened to her if the child didn't die or the law didn't take place? So, so let's just be mindful that it's hard for us. Let, you know, case in point, if you have a child that has mental health, if any of you has ever known a family member that has mental health, for you to come knocking at my door in the office, right? What I do, I don't stand in the point of judgment. As a clinician, everyone is very important and they are individualized. I will never judge a client. I will make everything possible for that client to, to, for me to build rapport with that person. So that person will come to a point where they will really talk to me. If they don't talk to me, I don't assume. I never go behind my client to do anything. I tell them, you were referred for therapy because you need help. I want to be able to help you so you can manage your life. I am not managing your life for you. I'm only providing skills and coping methods so that you can manage your life to the best way you can handle it. 
But what I'm understanding from our sister that spoke from Nigeria, they manage people's lives and sending the child back to them. And that is where the issue is. So if I have a son that is mentally ill, I, as a parent, I would deny it at first, right? I will give it to the devil, go call the priest, call the <laughs> minister, and then I will do everything that is unnecessary before I face my challenges, right? But here, many of us are also running away as a parent. I've seen parents uh, transporting their children who are troubled to so their parents in Nigeria. Mm. Some of them comes out good, some of them become an umbrella, even worse in Nigeria, and then you will never hear mm. it again. So we all have a problem. We all have issues. We all have, sister, as I said, I'm telling you, you know, in life with mental health, we really need to be able to be truthful to ourselves. I have to be truthful to Katie, for Katie to come out to even ask you for help. There are times Katie will die in her own need. Mm -hmm. that's our culture. Mm. That's how I could, but if I come out of the way, sister, so I have a problem. When you might say, Oh my god, and then you disappear. See, yes. I've already told you my problem, I don't know who you're gonna tell. So, mm. because of that, I will just be quiet and be dying in it's my silent. <laughs> So, I mean, that's I just want to yes. stop here. Let somebody okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yes. Um, we are about to wrap up <laughs> for this program. We have been here for more than two hours. And next time we'll come back again, maybe we'll stay through another topic in this area of uh, raising children in the West <laughs> and also comparing it with African setting. So, yeah, thank you all for today's discussion. Uh, uh, Ms. Joyce from Nigeria, I know that the network is not very strong. You did everything to ensure that uh, you joined this program today and you contributed. Thank you. Your input was so, so, so important. Thank you so much. Miss Katie Salami, all the way from California. Thank you. Miss <laughs> Esosa, thank you, Matt. Oh, we worked so hard to actualize to this program. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So I think- uh, Good evening, everyone. It was lovely to have you all. Lovely yeah. to see you. If we have to continue, this topic is very broad. Yeah, I think it's very broad. broad. Yes. Absolutely. Otherwise, we'll yeah. be here for yeah. six hours. We'll still yes. be debating. About <laughs> it's too broad. So let's just call it short. And next time, we'll definitely come back. Again. Good evening, everyone. It was lovely Thank to meet you. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Really, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.